It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Joseph Wachschlag. Dr. Wachschlag is Professor of Clinical Nutrition and Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation at Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. He received his veterinary degree from Cornell in 1998 and became board certified in veterinary clinical nutri nutrition in 2008. More recently, Dr. Wachschlag became a charter member of the American College of Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation, along with AMC's own Dr. Leilani Alvarez. Um, welcome, Dr. Wachschlag, and thank you so much for making time in your schedule to lead tonight's event. Oh, thanks. This is a, it's a hot topic, always is, and probably always will be in, in uh, we'll say, American society. I think it's not just our pets, as we all know. We all have a little problem. I'm, I'm in the middle of what I'll call a lifestyle change myself uh, after the quarantine, put on a good 15, probably closer to 20. So let me share my screen and uh, kind of get this started. So um, when I started my career at Cornell, I, I kind of thought obesity would be what I studied uh, most, but uh, I kind of got more into the rehab thing. And one of my first things was to kind of study, study obesity and look at activity, and you'll see some of that data a little bit later. Um, but I, I, what I, I'm going to say is that uh, if we kind of look at this dog, this is Gus, and Gus is kind of round. He looks more like a tick than a dog. Um, and <clears throat> When you look at Gus, uh, we got basically we got this body condition score of eight all the way down to a five, and I think his uh, owner Joan did know what I'm going to call the uh, laws of physics to some degree, and uh, she she basically would bring us brownies every time she could come in for a weigh-in, and uh, I think we all gained a lot of Gus's weight uh, ourselves, and so uh, mass in the universe doesn't change, and unfortunately, uh, I think Gus transferred his to us. Uh, that said, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the topics we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about obesity, of course, and the sort of epidemiology. What are the percentages and what are the type of things that are happening um, from a health perspective? We're going to talk about sort of this pathophysiology of how this happens to some degree. It's going to get a little complex, but uh, hang with me for the first 10 or so minutes because uh, then we're just going to get into some good old fun math. Um, we're going to talk about some of these pitfalls and where to start with a diet plan. And then I think a lot of you, you out there go to the, the pet store and then you say to yourself, well, I'm just going to buy this weight management food. seems like it's probably lower in calories. It says it's weight management and we'll see how things go. And I'm not going to go buy that expensive veterinary stuff, that therapeutic diet that that vet's trying to sell me. And uh, it can be done either way. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the trouble with cats um, because cats are just harder than dogs. You can't ignore a cat who's walking on your keyboard as they probably are right now. Um, I see a few cats already walking on keyboards and on, on beds, kind of checking this whole thing out in the background. Um, and then, of course, we'll talk about activity and, and how much activity might be needed to be, to be really helpful. So uh, that said, you know, since the 70s, veterinarians have been pretty interested in, in the incidence of obesity. And if you look at some of the earlier work, it was in that sort of 25 to 35 range in, in the UK, kind of through the 70s and the 80s. And it wasn't as big of a problem as it is today. You can see other countries like Austria, maybe it's because of the good pastries over there or something, that it was a little higher at 44%. <clears throat> and if we looked at some of the older cat data, you can see back in the 70s, obesity really wasn't a problem in cats. And that's before that a lot of them moved into our houses. And I think that's part of where uh, the activity really does come into play. And, and we know a lot more about how many calories cats need. And, and it's uh, actually shockingly little. And so that's why I think we have to be a little more diligent with cats. But you can see in Denmark, it was around 40% in the 90s, 94, 95, it was around 25%. And then one of the largest US uh, studies was done looking at the uh, obesity and, and overweight dogs. And you can see that dogs are overweight or what we would call a body condition score of six all the way up to nine. And you can see that basically about 66% of our dogs in the US are considered to be overweight uh, when body condition scored. And so uh, that's, that's not particularly encouraging. We're not going in the right direction in general. Um, <clears throat> if we look at cats, wish I could say cats were any better, but this is a couple of years ago, the um, pet obesity survey really um, looked at a good number of cats and, and uh, they found it was over 60% or roughly 60% as well. So it's been hard to make end roads. And to be honest with you, uh, <clears throat> it's not that we 
should give up. We just have to get a little more diligent um, with what we're feeding and trying to come up with creative solutions when our cat decides to wake us up at three o'clock in the morning to eat. So here's, I guess, the, the more sort of, we'll say shocking data is looking here at, at roughly, um, you know, all the diseases that seem to be associated with being an obese dog or overweight dog. And you can see insulin resistance, just like in people, is a problem in dogs. It's probably a worse problem in cats. And in general, cats do get insulin resistance due to being obese and will develop diabetes. I know a lot of people draw, like to blame dry food, but uh, dry food has very small associations with that, if any at all. And the reality is, is dry food eaters tend to eat more and tend to have more calories and tend to be more obese. And that seems to be the trend. And so we'll talk a little bit about wet food for cats and some of the, the pluses for that. Um, <clears throat> we got all kinds of wonderful lamenesses and hip dysplasia and osteoarthritis and well-defined in the dog uh, that if you just take off 10 to 12% of the weight, your dog's osteoarthritis will get better. And that's, that's just, you know, study after study keeps showing that uh, they basically use their legs that are bad better when they've lost weight. And there are probably a number of reasons we'll talk about. Urinary tract disease, obese cats tend to get lower urinary tract disease more often. Maybe it's because they eat more food, therefore they develop more crystals because they're processing all that food. And we know that they actually have inflammatory mediators that are being released from the fat tissue. So that's kind of the newest and latest and greatest is they found that people with osteoarthritis in their hands actually have worse osteoarthritis when they're obese. And they, you know, you use your hands, you don't walk on them. Um, so it's been pretty well defined that some of these inflammatory mediators, if you can quench those and get those down, you can actually um, improve uh, your clinical signs. Cardiovascular changes, we all know. Um, <clears throat> heart has to work harder if you're obese. And of course, long longevity, it's been well defined that, that if, if you basically keep your dog at a good body condition score, they live at least two years longer. So those are definitely advantages. Um, oral disease and skin diseases have been associated with obesity in cats. You gotta think about cats always having to clean themselves, right? And particularly ones that are outdoors and seeing too many maggots in, in obese cats that you know, makes, me, makes me cringe when, when I see a fat cat who's an outside cat coming in. And then of course, uh, it's been associated with kidney pathology, worsening of kidney disease, and then of course, uh, developing pancreatitis. So there's a lot of things that are involved here and that's what we're trying to prevent is the relative risk of developing some of these problems. And of course you can't, you know, lean dogs will develop all these things too, but you decrease the risk of them. And this is actually, I think a, a nice little uh, flow diagram from Speakman in 2002, which I constantly use because a lot, a lot of us think uh, that uh, genetics play a big role in all of this, but the reality is, is that our environment probably plays a bigger role. And I think uh, we were just having this discussion uh, about dog walkers in New York City. And uh, how many of you know how many treats are your dog is getting from the dog walker? Or how many treats uh, is the dog getting when it visits the dry cleaner and then the, the, you know, the local coffee shop, et cetera? So those are some of the things I think we have to take into consideration <clears throat> and have a better understanding about. So it's all about behavior. Now, yes, the foods you choose are important. And of course, most of the things that we like to feed our dogs are chicken jerky treats and bully sticks, et cetera. Of course, have quite a few calories and it's just like going to a cocktail party, right? You'd be a little bit offended if you went to a cocktail party and there weren't some finger foods for you to nosh on while you were drinking your cocktails. Uh, the reality is, is uh, I think when we're at home with our dogs, we should really be uh, hitting, hitting the vegetables and the rice cakes a little bit more than, than some of the things that we hit. Um, and then, of course, there's, of course, your metabolic rate, and that's where things are always very difficult. I mean, I've seen dogs that are well beyond or well below their resting energy, um, you know, like 80% of what they should at ideal body weight be metabolizing from an energy perspective. So there's just easy keepers, right? Newfoundland's notorious easy keepers, Bassett's, Corgi's, notorious easy keepers. And then, of course, that activity component you can see there sort of right in the middle uh, under the physiology. And you can see it's got very small arrows because most dogs, most people aren't active enough to make significant gains or losses in, in, in their uh, calorie expenditure based on our lifestyles. And then we have to talk about this sort of this pathobiology of why do we become obese? And the reality is, is we starved a lot in our past and so did dogs. Therefore, you have this uh, sort of homeostatic mechanism that says, hey, if you have food, you should eat it. 
Um, <clears throat> now we're in, you know, we've got plenty of food. We're in this wonderful industrialized society. And we basically have, in essence, too much food. And then some of the ways that we sort of prepare these foods for dogs doesn't help the whole situation, that's for sure. But what's interesting is with, there's this lipostatic model that has been pretty well defined. And actually, when you eat a high carb diet, you really don't suppress your appetite that much. And that's part of the problem with high carb diets is your appetite doesn't get suppressed. Higher fat diets tend to suppress your appetite better because they actually go and act in your, your GI tract and make you produce hormones that go back to your brain and say, hey, we're, we're a little bit too heavy on the, on the, on the fat these, these days. So those are the kind of things that we have to sort of contend with. And these are a list of all these strange peptides and, and uh, they call them orexigenic, which means I want to eat or anorexigenic, right? Anorexia, anorexigenic agents. <clears throat> what you can see is anorexigenic agents. A lot of them are in this central nervous system. And then there are some that come from the periphery, right? And then we have anorexigenic agents also coming from the central nervous system feeding in from the periphery. So the periphery and what happens in the periphery goes to the brain and kind of tells you whether you might want to eat or not. And you can see there's all kinds of interesting things in here. Uh, I won't get into the, the nitty gritty of it. I'll just give you a little flow diagram later. But the reality is you can see things like cocaine and amphetamine related transcripts. So for uh, those of you who, uh, I guess it was Studio 54 back in the 80s, if any of, uh, any of you are that old, doing a little line or two, understanding why you didn't get hungry when <laughs> when you're on cocaine is because it's an anorexigenic agent. It makes you not want to eat. Same thing, endocannabinoids, which is on the orexigenic side, right? They go to the central nervous system, these endocannabinoids, right? They actually go and make you want to eat a little bit. Um, so you can see there's a list of all kinds of cool things here. And if you kind of just put it into a nutshell, what really happens is you have this area in your brain called the arcuate nucleus, which has these really small clusters of neurons and you can see that all the things that are negative there basically uh, influence the palm cart neurons, which is the opioblanocortin, cocaine amphetamine related transcripts, uh, the things that are released when you sniff cocaine, right, to cause you to decrease your appetite and your feeding behavior. And there's a lot of things coming from the GI, in particular insulin, something called PYY, GLP. You guys might, some of you might be pre diabetics and may be on a, be on a GLP 1 agonist. Um, <clears throat> these things, actually cause mild anorexigenic behavior, while there are only a few things that cause you to really want to eat, and those are cortisol, which those of you who have had a dog on prednisone might understand that your dog wanted to eat more and wanted to eat your, uh, eat your stockings, right, because they were so hungry, and that's what cortisol does. It sort of influences this orexigenic pathway, and it feeds back into the hypothalamus, and you release these small peptides that basically neurologically tell you that you want to eat. And these things are, in essence, these are drugs that we already have. So I just talked about the GLP-1 uh, analog. We used to have Victoza. Now we've got Ozempic, right? These are actually things that you inject um, either a couple times a week or once a week. And they're actually supposed to make you more insulin sensitive. Well, that's all well and good. But actually, if you read the side effects, it says you may lose you know, 10 to 15 pounds while on this because it's going to your brain and telling you you don't need to eat as much. So it, it does work. Problem is that your brain is homeostatically kind of ready, right? And it says, I'm getting too much of a signal to not eat. This can't be right. So you downregulate the receptors in your brain so that you start to pick up your appetite again. So hard to control. Then we have this idea that if I get more and more adipose tissue and I start to get fatter, Basically, I get these strange little things inside my fat. So this is actually histopathology down here. This is a histo picture of a cross-section of fat looked at under a microscope. And what you end up seeing are these, we call them crown-like structures, which are inflammatory cells surrounding adipocytes, which are what store the fat. As they get bigger, you get more and more of these crown-like structures. And that's the inflammation that's occurring. And your adipocytes start to release things that call in inflammatory cells and activate them. And that's partly because the blood flow is trying to get rid of cells that aren't living too well, some of those adipocytes. And the reality is, is those adipocytes are actually releasing inflammatory mediators. <clears throat> and those are the things that are leading to the potential cardiovascular disease, leading to increased arthritis, clinical signs, and basically causing an increase in diabetes. So these are the things that we're trying to prevent. So yes, crazy, complex stuff. It is definitely well beyond 
me and I've been teaching this for a long time. And the reality is don't expect you to understand all, all that stuff. But the reality is, is that we do have ways to pharmacologically intervene in, in, in terms of obesity. Are we doing that in dogs and cats yet? We tried in the 2007, 2008, and there was actually a wonderful drug called Slentrol that increased this peptide from your GI tract called PYY, caused dogs to go off food. It was kind of crazy because if you gave too much of it, your dog would just stop eating and it freaked people out because it was just weird, right? <clears throat> so to that end, let's just talk about weight loss and what are these predispositions and things that, that we need to try to control. And the reality is, is that neuter status is definitely associated with <clears throat> an increase in appetite. Neuter status is also uh, influencing the activity status, particularly in male dogs. Therefore, if you're not as active, you tend to gain weight quicker. And so this is part of what, there's a big debate, should you or shouldn't you neuter your dog? Um, so if you castrate your males or spay your females, reality is, is sometimes I even recommend it for dogs that are really picky and people are having a hard time because they have GI disease. I was like, if you spay her, she'll probably eat better. Now that's not what we want, but the reality is, is that we can't have dogs running all over you know, New York City wandering the streets. So we all recommend spaying and neutering. Type of diet can definitely influence this. And so, you know, dry diets versus wet diets versus uh, we'll say home prepared diets that we have to do a lot of because we get dogs that are just so metabolically inactive that we need to kind of go uh, to something that's so low in calories that we have to do that. Schedule and method of feeding are of course important things, particularly when it comes to cats because everybody's in a multi-cat household and you're trying to keep cats out of each other's bowls and cats start fighting, et cetera, same with dogs. And then there are some breed predispositions. If you get a corgi and you spay or neuter it, expect it to live on air. I mean, that's just how they are. And then of course, last is owners need to be aware. And I, most New Yorkers are pretty darn aware of body condition. You start getting out in more rural areas, not so much, but we really have to understand these body condition scoring charts, right? And how much overweight is your dog or cat if they get a body condition score that's not a four or a five. <clears throat> and you can see from the 2017 study, you know, you have 20 or 30 percent that are in that four to five range, but you got 60 percent that are six and above. If you have a body condition score of six, that's 10 percent overweight, roughly. Seven is about 20 percent. Eight is, you know, 30 percent. Nine is 40 percent. And <clears throat> what you really should be doing is kind of looking down from the top on your at your dog and looking for that mild silhouette, right? So a bit of a tuck uh, in the abdomen. Uh, underneath and then on from the top you want to sort of see that hourglass silhouette where the hips are a little wider than the midsection and the chest is of course a little wider than the midsection. And so you can see from these little charts that we have that same uh, same kind of thing in the cat and interestingly cats love to sort of put fat inside their abdomens uh, more so than even the sub-Q so they actually build up a lot of intra-abdominal fat uh, very often, and they get that nice little apron. I like to call it. The, I like to call it the apron. Basically, they get the, the the belly pads there that are big and soft and gushy. And a uh, normal body condition score in a cat, you shouldn't have an apron. You should feel two small uh, folds of tissue with no fat in them. So, I mean, these are the things that I think we need to be a little bit more cognizant of as owners, for sure. This is actually one of my favorite papers because they basically put dogs on a weight loss program. Uh, and they stratified them. And they basically put half of the dogs onto a owner education program where they had seminars every month when the dogs came in for their weigh-in so that people would understand body condition score. They would understand inflammation of obesity. They would really kind of like get a, you know, an education like we're doing tonight. And then they did a, another group that just came in every month and got weighed in and was given the right amount of food and then you know trying to get them to lose one to two percent per week, which is sort of a goal that we tend to shoot for. And uh, amazingly, he found that owner education did absolutely nothing for improving the weight loss. And so that's why it's kind of my favorite paper is it's all about getting to the vet and weighing your dog. I don't care. In today's day and age, you can't get to the vet because of COVID. Pick your dog up. Stand on the scale, put yourself on the scale, subtract your dog from you and see what the rough weight is of your dog. I think those things are just so much more important than having somebody at the veterinary office. And the reality is, is it's, it's Weight Watchers. If you have to go in in a month to weigh your dog at a vet's office or you know you're gonna be doing it and then reporting it to the vet tech. My vet tech is, I, 
I love her. She's, she's firm. She tells people you're killing your dog. So, so be it, uh, you know, that, that's your choice, but you really should be doing something better for your dog. And so it's, it's great to have somebody like that who you can kind of follow through with and kind of be your coach uh, for, for you and your dog um, when things aren't going right in particular. And so I don't really suggest much at a BCS of six. I warn owners and I say, well, your body condition score is a six. You might want to cut back in the food a little. What are you feeding? You know, oh yeah, maybe you're feeding four cups. Really should be only feeding around three, three and a half. What kind of treats you feed, et cetera. And I ask a lot of questions because to be honest with you, when people don't know or aren't compliant or don't really worry about it, I'm wasting my time. And I think it's really the peer folks that come in who are interested in the weight reduction plan that we can really have an engagement. We can really talk about what needs to be done and talk about a follow-up program. The reality is, is it's difficult. And a lot of the dogs that we deal with are dogs that went onto a diet plan from a vet it didn't really work that well, or they only lost a few pounds and then they plateaued and then we had to go further. So <clears throat> it's all about math, unfortunately. And there are all kinds of ways to sort of divvy up the math. And you can see that there's this sort of strange linear equation on the top for the dog and the cat. And I'm gonna tell you, I like the linear equation for the dog, for the cat. And I like this exponential equation for the dog to figure out how many calories they should really be eating. And that's uh, really because dogs, as they get bigger and bigger, they become less metabolically active. And so this sort of accommodates for that. <clears throat> so if, you know, if a, a 50 kg Newfoundland definitely needs fewer calories per metabolic body weight, which is what that calculation there would be is the metabolic body weight. They need fewer calories than a chihuahua, it's just a given, just based on size. And so we use that equation. And then for the cats, we tend to use a linear and we'll kind of go through some of that math. And this is the reason is that if I actually use that linear equation up top, which was 30 times the kilogram in, bo in body weight, and we always use the ideal body weight in these equations, we don't use the current fatty weight. We use the, what we think that golden retriever should be. And this is the problem is that if you use that linear equation for a larger and larger dog, you can see you can have up to like a four or 500 kcal discrepancy if you're feeding an Irish wolfhound versus if they're like 25 kgs. So using that exponential equation, it was always a pain in the rear end. <clears throat> Never really liked using it because much easier to kind of scribble down 30 times the kigs and ideal body weight plus 70. And then you, you put in a little bit of a metabolic factor. So I'll take you through those numbers. So this is a typical candidate. It's a golden retriever, female spade, a little heavy, eight years old, 98 pounds, pretty inactive obviously consuming a little bit too much, right? <clears throat> so four cups at about 350 kcals per cup, <clears throat> eating about 1400 kcals. So that is overconsumption probably because based on what an ideal body weight is, the dog should probably be eating less somewhere around between three and four. But the reality is, is that is only half of the diet history. And we just talked about the other part of the diet history, which is what's get, getting given at the wine store, what, the, what are the dry cleaners doing, what's the dog walker doing, and what table foods are they giving. And most people don't fess up that they like to give table foods because they think vets are going to get mad at them. And the reality is, is when the survey was done looking at table foods, about 25% of calories were coming from table foods. And then, of course, treats were, are a big part of that, too. So folks who feed table foods feed around 25%. People who feed treats tend to feed around 20, 25% of that overall daily intake from that too. And of course, there's all kinds of sizes. This is why veterinarians hate doing this because you gotta sit back and figure out, well, how much is a pizza crust? How many pizza crusts do you get? Oh yeah, mashed potatoes from, from KFC, how, you know, is it a cup, is it two cups? So these are the kind of things that we always worry about. And I know that folks in New York are always, their dogs are always eating things off the ground. Um, I had a, my, my dad's dog used to get about three cups of food every day. And then he used to, his, his brother used to hunt on his land and his dog would look like a tick around Christmas time because he would be out there eating all the deer guts. And then as soon as the spring came around, he wasn't getting the deer guts anymore. He took all his weight off in the, in the summer. So all kinds of reasons to be a little heavy. So when we use the ideal body weight, so this is our golden retriever again, and we're gonna use this equation, right? So that's 35 and a half is what we think kilograms is what this dog should weigh, okay? And then you're gonna actually 
type it into your, your calculator 0 0.075 as the exponent, exponent, and then you're going to multiply it by 95. Typically, we do something that is quote unquote a little bit higher. That would be considered the energy, or sorry, maintenance energy requirement for that 95, or sorry, for that, uh, that 35 kg dog, right? The ideal body weight. And that 95 that I have there is sort of for the inactive obese prone. Typically, if you're going to do the resting energy requirement, which is 70, not 95 in that equation up top, we basically then give an activity factor. But in my experience, we don't need activity factors. And so the maintenance energy requirement for this dog would be about 1,381 calories. But now I'm going to bump it back to 60% of that, right? 60% is only 828. So that old food that she was eating at four cups a day is now at two cups. And you can maybe get in a couple of small milk bones that are 25 calories, whatever, find some treats if they feel like they have to feed treats. And math is, of course, hard, and nobody wants to do exponents, and nobody wants to carry calculators around. But it's funny enough, five years ago, I said, oh, you know, I never really like to use it. And then somebody said, you know, if you just turn your iPhone to the side, you can do this math. I was like, wow, this is revolutionary. We all have iPhones and Androids, et cetera. And so let's use an example of what should be a 30 kilogram Labrador. All right, so a 30 kilogram Labrador, you pump that into the, uh, the equation. You then go and you hit the X to the Y, which is on that iPhone right there. And then you hit 0.75. And then you do 0.75 and hit equals, and it gives you 12.81. That's considered the metabolic body weight of the dog. That's active living tissue, not bone, not fat, you know, not the sub Q. It's basically the active cells in the dog. And it's only less than half is what would be considered the quote unquote metabolic body weight that we're feeding. That said, I type in 70 because that's resting energy. I had 95 in that last equation for that golden because you know, that dog was just being overfed and she's, uh, you know, obese prone. If you look at that table I gave you, 95 was a better one to put in. It's all fuzzy math, bottom line. So these are the resting energy would be 897 calories. And then from there, you could kind of figure out. Now, if it's an easy keeper, like we were talking, I never, I just stick with resting energy and I just use it. And then I do 60%. So this dog actually, a 30 kilogram, uh, you know, a fat Labrador who needs to be 30 kilograms, should only get 538 kcals a day to lose weight. That's not much food. And that's the hard part, right? If you have a dog who's obviously being overfed and you're trying to get some weight loss, then I typically go to about 80% of that resting energy. Sometimes when they're hugely overfed, I can feed resting energy and get a little weight loss. But I want to be productive. I want you to go in as an owner and hit the scale with your dog and go, whoa, we're making progress. Because the minute you go in there and go, hey, this ain't working, you give up. So once again, it's Weight Watchers mentality. So when we do that sort of calculation, we're expecting 1% to 2% weight loss per week. Sometimes we get up to 3%, which is phenomenal. And we keep them there. Bottom line is if you can get in for weigh-ins and you know compliance is part of this, you, know, you get your, your dog and you weigh them in, you will start keeping track and then you create this accountability, particularly if your vet's doing it because they're going to yell at you, right? And then, of course, anthropomorphic behaviors, uh, you know, food equals love. I know that you know, all, everybody likes to feed because that's what we like to do. Even the vets have treats, right? Shouldn't even have treats at a vet's office. And then, of course, there's begging and aggression and then food-seeking behaviors. We had a dog, you know, broke in and ate an entire bag of cat food, right? I mean... And then there's always that question, do you use a therapeutic or an over-the-counter type of diet? And so what I'm going to say to you guys, and you know, kind of running a little low on time, I want to get to some other stuff, is the reality is, is when you go to that grocery store and you see weight management, or you see things that say weight control or healthy weight, it means absolutely nothing. There are only two terms on dog foods, which are light and lean. That means that those dog foods have less than 3,100 kcals per kg in dry matter, or cat food 3,250. And so those are the things you should be gravitating to if you're going to make a food change from your average 350 kcal uh, food. It's going to at least have closer to 300 kcals per cup or whatever. And problem with all these foods is that they label the calories on the bag. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of math here. 
And this is actually the math that comes to, <laughs> that comes out when you actually do what's considered the modified Atwater equation that AFCO uses to calculate calories coming from protein, fat, and carb. And you can see protein has 3.5 kcals per gram, fat has 8.5, carb has 3.5. That's very different than what you see on the human labeling. In the human world, protein is 4 kcals per gram, fat is 9, carb is 4. And you can see that depending on the digestibility of that food and <clears throat> what is being labeled, most companies do it based on the label and based on their guaranteed analysis. And there's things says it's 24% protein, 12% fat. Well, in all reality, it might be 26% protein and 14% fat. And when you do the math, you can see how 100 grams of food that is labeled as 340 kcals actually has 406 because it's just a more digestible food than what we're used to from the 1970s when AFCO put these funky numbers together, okay? So we really don't know, and this becomes part of the problem, is that that's why we talk about things like therapeutic diets, right? So I'll kind of briefly go over this. This is a Roddy who basically had been complaining the dog was having a hard time losing weight. So basically this dog should be about 40 kgs, was uh, about 53. We did our resting energy requirement based on the uh, exponential equation, 40 to the 0.75 power times 70. And the reality is, is that dog only needs roughly about 1,113 kcals. I'm sorry, I think I, uh, <clears throat> I kind of messed up because I also was showing you that 1270 you see down there was actually if you did the exponent, uh, did the linear equation. And so regardless of what equation you end up using, we have to go down to 60%, which is like 667 kcals. All right, I'm gonna use a regular light food that's got 325 kcals per cup, but it might actually have 350 or 375. I don't know, because it's from over the counter. Give her two cups, right? <clears throat> it's not formulated for weight loss, but we're using it for weight loss. This is where we might get into some vitamin mineral problems, hypothetically. And then weight reduction foods are about 220 to 270 kcals per cup. So the dog can get at least a little bit more food. And these weight reduction therapeutic foods are designed to have extra vitamin mineral to ensure that dogs get the good slug of what they really need during a weight loss program. This problem was that this dog started fighting with other dogs, was really quite ravenous and was only losing just under 1% per week after four weeks. This is a problem. We needed to actually get down to around 600 calories roughly or maybe even lower. And this is where canned food comes in. And if you look at the fourth and fifth bullet point there, fifth and sixth, the lowest kcal food I could possibly give as a dry food of 275, uh, 2.75 cups at about 600 kcals. That's roughly 22 ounces of food in the dry form. It's just so, you know, it doesn't look like much, right? If I go get a canned food, this canned foods that are for therapeutic weight loss have fewer calories in general, and they have almost twice the volume. It's a 12 and a half to 13 ounce can. So the dog can then eat 35 to 40 ounces rather than just the 22 ounces. So you almost get to double the volume, which helps a little bit with gastric fill and actually helps you with peace of mind. Is the dog gonna be less hungry? Probably not. <clears throat> That's when we just start adding in a cup of green beans to try and help with gastric fill. Because a cup of green beans is 35 calories. It can be actually added per cup. And that's what we do with a lot of folks. One cup of green beans, one cup of food in the morning, one cup of green beans, one cup of food in the night. Sometimes that does work. Some of the advantages of these therapeutics is that they are often higher in protein and also have things like carnitine added to them, which appear to help in weight loss, particularly for cats. So that's why we recommend these therapeutic type of foods. And the reality is, is when you go find some of those weight management foods on the shelf, the reality is, is they're actually quite low in protein and that doesn't help maintain the lean mass on the dog while the dog is actually losing weight or the cat. And then of course, they always add fiber to some of these foods and there's plenty of experimental uh, studies looking at if you increase fiber, they will eat less of a meal and get fewer calories for sure, but we're already restrict feeding them. They're gonna eat it all. And that satiety because of the fiber only lasts a couple of hours typically. It doesn't last all day long doesn't last all night long, which is kind of the problem with fiber. So my dogs have always been lean. Uh, that below is that's my dog, Roxy, when she was a pup. She actually is a mastiff. It looks like a Great Dane. She had an angular limb deformity. And we kept her as lean as possible. And she ate four cups of food her entire life. 
and that was her body condition. You can see a few ribs floating there. She's beautiful. I used to have sled dogs. We kept them all in great condition. But the reality is, is everybody's got a cat. Cats are always more difficult and they get fat quick. And the reality is, is when we actually look at cat studies now uh, from Bauer and, and Dr. Hill down uh, in Florida and Texas, they basically determined that most cats that are indoor cats that live with us are at about resting energy. So <clears throat> resting energy is what much, most cats need. And that is gonna be hard because we are now talking about feeding cats literally in the 100 kcal range, 120 kcal range to get them to lose weight. So we usually start with about 70% of resting energy requirement of a higher protein food because we know cats require protein and that's why we tend to like to use some of the therapeutics over what's on, on the shelf, but there are plenty of things on the shelf that can actually fit the bill too. And so if you have an outside cat, you might try a little bit more because you know they're outside and they're hunting a little bit, but of course you can't control them because they are bringing in shrews and mice and all these fun things. And then of course we have to train folks to feed meal style rather than ad lib, which is of course it's hard because Cats, when they get hungry at night, they come and walk on your head or they headbutt and meow outside your door all night long and they don't quit. They're not like dogs. And so this is where we kind of use this linear equation for cats because bottom line is there's no 30 kilogram cat. And all cats kind of fit within this sort of linear equation. It's an easy type of thing to do. And so we typically say if the, dog, if the cat's at resting energy, it's a 12 pound cat, we should be about eight and a half, nine pounds. 12 divided by 2.2 is 5.5 kgs. He needs to be four. And so we throw that four kgs into the linear equation. Four times 30 plus seven, 190 calories. Easy. That will maintain that fat cat, but that cat won't lose weight. So we have to get down to around 70%, which is only about 133 calories a day. And there are plenty of cats that are under that resting energy. And we have, I've had plenty of cats that are like 110 calories to get to become a four kg cat. So that's what we have to watch for. And this is my cat, Kermit. I'm gonna take you through a small journey, which is the fact that I, of course, had two cats. One needed to lose weight. The other one was on an enteric formula for some GI problems. And so I had to make the fat no more box. And so you can see my box and there are commercial ones available, the little mazes you can put the food in and the small cat can get in and the fat cat can't. It took me a while to build mine, but I have a little opening there. My, uh, my cat can go in and eat ad lib, my thin cat and my fat cat uh, basically uh, can't get in there to get her food and we can restrict feed him. And so of course the problem is that when people start feeding, you can see here there's the way uh, my family likes to dole out food. I've got the generous, the chintzy, and the precise. Ben basically was pretty much the precise one. He gave 26.7 and he always looked at it, took a like knife or something and kind of leveled it off. Max didn't really care. He just kind of took a scoop and put it in. It was always a little bit low. And then of course, my, my daughter and my wife were a little more generous. And this is a difference, if you look below there, of about 20 calories per feeding. And this was twice a day I was feeding him this, a quarter of a cup. This is why cups stink for cats because you can add an extra 40 kcals very quickly. So I just don't use these darn cups for cats. We use kitchen scales. They are inexpensive and easy enough to do. What I had to do with my cat, because he was a pain, is I did the evening switcheroo. So watch this fun video. This is actually my cat. I'm weighing out his food. He's getting his roughly 27 grams. That's roughly a quarter of a cup. There's his head. He's interested in having his meal. And I'm actually getting some zucchini. I microwave my chopped zucchini in about the same size as his kibble. And I then microwave it for about 20 seconds or so, 10 seconds, for whatever reason he liked his microwave, you can do it raw. And then I put it in with his kibble. And that's about an eighth of a cup of chopped zucchini. You put it in and you feed it. And so we get it all ready. I'll show you me getting it all ready and he's gonna go for it like crazy. And you're gonna to say to yourself, well, he's gonna leave all that damn zucchini, right? So I'm not gonna to torture you with this meal. I'm gonna show you the end result. Strangely enough, zucchinis and squashes chopped about the same size as kibble. I don't think they know what they're eating. 
And this is basically him finished his meal. He's left a few kibble behind. He's feeling fairly satiated right now. And there's only one piece of zucchini, two. The rest of it's kibble. So that's why I like to call the old zucchini switcheroo, something definitely worth trying if you have a cat who wants to walk on your head in the middle of the night to get a little more gastric fill. Lastly, switching to a canned food can help. It's been shown that cats who switch to a canned food in a structured calorie reduction program actually get more gastric fill than with dry, therefore they don't eat. Now they eventually catch up and start eating more, but that gastric fill from the wet food because it's much fewer calories in six ounces than in that uh, half of a cup of food, which is only four. And of course we all know that canned food helps the urinary tract problems. So I'm, I'm a kind of a big fan of trying the canned approach, but of course we have dry feeders only or people that would need to feed both. So we're gonna talk about activity and I'm gonna tell you that I never believed that cats were active. This is one of my favorite kids book about a cat who runs the Iditarod with sled dogs. Danger is the only active cat I've ever known. I know we like laser pointers, we like feather toys. I know we like all these things and some cats go for it. But I'm gonna to tell you most cats get bored, particularly older cats and those are the ones that are usually overweight. But lo and behold, occasionally you get lucky. You have a cat who likes to do something. And this is my fetching cat. So this is how I keep my cat going. We keep her active. She loves to fetch her ball. She bats it all over the place. So you can usually find something that a cat's interested in, but it takes time. And sometimes you gotta push it around, do the laser pointers, get the feather. And listen, when she wants to play ball, she brings it to me and we go, we play ball for 20 minutes. She gets bored after 20 minutes, maybe, maybe half hour, but it's better than nothing. Now we did a study in dogs, which is kind of interesting. And I'll just kind of try and finish up with this in a couple of minutes here is that we basically took a bunch of dogs and said to people, hey, here's a pedometer for you and your dog. We want you all to walk more. We kind of washed them out before and then gave them the task after two weeks of going onto the new diet and understanding what they're eating and understanding their daily activity in general. And we encourage them to walk four to five times a week, at least two miles. And these were the washout steps before we kind of told them to go crazy and do this fun stuff with their dog. And you can see within the first month, they walked exactly the same amount. And by month six, for most of these, same amount. So owners don't walk more. Now, New Yorkers are good about this in general. You're at AMC, that's why you're, you're on this call. Yeah, probably not a bad idea, tell a New Yorker, but when you tell people up here in the rural upstate New York, it just doesn't happen. When we kind of looked at the differences when we stratified the dogs into active and inactive, and we looked at their overall step counts, the active dog took about 5,000 more steps than quote unquote inactive dogs when we stratified it down the middle. And the things that were different was the fact that per kilogram of metabolic body weight, the inactive dogs were eating about 42 kcals per kg on average during the weight loss while the active dogs were actually eating 53. So it really shows you that there is a, definitely a difference in an active dog versus inactive. So there is some benefit. But the problem is, is that when you kind of do a regression and try and figure out how many kcals per step, et cetera, and the bottom line is that if you'd look at a typical Labrador retriever, there's about 20 to 25 kcals in a thousand steps. And that's about a half of a mile for a Labrador. And the reality is, is that if we tell them to walk for that full mile, that's only 50 to 60 calories. So we're not making a huge dent in that 20 minute walk with calories. And the problem is that people then run off and they get home and they go feed them a milk bone or whatever, or some kind of treat, sweet potato chew, half of a bully stick, pig's ear, all of a sudden you've negated your walk. So with that, we'll take some questions and, and uh, kind of try and get a, as many questions in as possible. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Um, we do have some questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, we have a few different questions in, in different ways people were asking about the two dogs. One has a finicky, one dog is a finicky eater. The other one won't eat what the other one likes. Um, I know we had the fat no more box with the cats. What about dogs, people who have two dogs? Um, keeping one, yeah. whether one needs more than the other, or what do you do? Yeah, with that? and I think, I think that's where, that's where we're, we're talking about, you know, putting one dog in a room or a gated area for the evening and letting them eat ad lib because they're such a finicky dog. And of course, when you separate dogs, it's it, you know, when you put them together, usually a finicky dog will want to eat because it's sort of that pack mentality. 
Um, so what we used to tell folks was basically is that, you know, listen, feed the normal dog, put the food down for that 10 minutes or five minutes. If the one dog eats it all, take the other dog and put them into a, you know, another room so that that dog can eat or uh, put them into, you know, a gated area in the house so that dog has a little bit of away time because sometimes dogs are actually intimidated by the other dog. So, I mean, that's about, I think, all you can do. And it's hard to build a fat no more box, particularly that size. So I think it's usually just about separating and feeding, which you can do for cats too. I just was lazy and just didn't want to have to keep kicking my black cat out of my, my tabby cat's bowl. <laughs> I love the fat no more box. It's great. Um, we have another question. I, I know many people ask about this. We won't go into it too much, but um, about home cooked diet and one dog is gaining weight and she's feeding a home cooked diet. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's tricky because yeah. you don't know how many calories perhaps. Yeah, or just... I think it's funny because that's usually what we go to and, and, you know, it depends on if you're home cooking and how fatty the meat is. And I mean, usually when we were putting together home cooked diets for dogs that are overweight, we were basically using meat and vegetables only. We're not even putting in any you know, rice or sweet potato or anything like that. Every, every cup of cooked rice is 200 calories. Every cup of you know sweet potato, 220, right? So, you know, a cup of green beans is 35. Uh, you know, cooked carrots is around 40 or 50. I mean, so those are just far lower calories. And so we often put diets together that meet the protein sufficiency for sure. And then it's basically protein source and veggie, and that's it they don't really need all the carb in their diets. It, you know, it's not a requirement. And so we actually go to that when these you know, commercial diets aren't working. We're often making home prepared diets that are literally at uh, 50 to 60% of the resting energy for dogs. And they at least get to eat more because the, you know, they can eat that five, six cups of vegetables as a Labrador and only have, you know, literally you know, 300 calories from that, and then they can actually get their 95% lean ground or ground chicken um, and get a fairly nice dose of that, you know, 10 to 12 ounces. So. Great. Um, can you speak a little bit about how, over how long a period weight should be lost? I know with cats, you definitely don't want to do it too quickly, but just, you know, yeah. I know it, it takes a while anyway with, with both, but just what's a safe amount and <clears throat> Yeah, that 70% number is as low as I go, 70% of the resting energy. Um, I've never seen a cat have a, a quote unquote bad reaction or hepatic lipidosis due to it. And I know people always say, oh, they, you, know, you gotta do weight loss a lot slower mm -hmm. with cats. That, that's as aggressive as I get. Sometimes I start them at resting energy and then slowly work them down. But in general, we don't have that big of a problem with that 120. And that's kind of why I like canned food, right? Yeah. So those sort of weight control or weight reduction, you go look in the calories on the side, it says like 118 in a six ounce can, half in the morning, half at night, nothing else. This is your new life and uh, it usually works out pretty well. And then I guess how many pounds or kilos per, per month for both yeah. dogs and cats? I mean, we, kinda, it varies <clears throat> the size, but. Yeah, one to 2% is very typical. So, I mean, we're talking about one to 2% per week. So that would be about four. I mean, I would not get upset if a cat was at uh, between four and 8% of their body weight. Um, yeah. and so that's usually kind of what we're shooting for. And to be honest with you, if it's slower with cats, we have plenty of cats that take six, eight, 10 months to lose their weight. Yeah. Um, and dogs. Yeah, so dogs, much. same thing. You usually you can get a little bit more aggressive with them so you can actually get more weight off. And there's actually a really old study where they starve dogs for I think three months. Yeah. There are no negative repercussions of starving dogs. They're just metabolically fit for it, right? Wow. Um, cats who have to have meals every day. I mean, they catch six to eight mice a day. That's their calories at 30 K cows to 40 K cows a mouse, right? So, um, you know, for the average active cat, you need five mice a day. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have also a question about human foods. I know that that can be tricky. So someone's asking, I know we, we talked about the zucchini, which is great. Um, good human foods to feed your dog and cat. They're nutritious, but, or should you limit them? You know, so what, how do you feel about human food? Yeah. I, I, I tell people that rice cakes are pretty wonderful. Um, because they're good for us for weight loss. They're, you know, those little tiny, I mean, I was just reading the package the other day. It's like 16 pieces of those little tiny active and fit from all these, right? Uh, the caramel ones, 16 of them have 106 calories. So it's 10 calories for that treat. And dogs like them, right? There are very few treats out there that are that size, right? And that crunch that are, are that low in calories. There's a few out there that are like 12 to 15, 
that are of similar size. So I think we can use those as treats just as much. And then of course, I have plenty of people who are using the old baby carrot, five calories in the baby carrot, carrot right? A green bean, less than three usually, right? You know, one of the chopped green beans from the frozen bag. Perfectly good treats and no calories really. So I tell to tell people to use those as their treats and you know, you got to from the pizza crust and the French fries. That's right. Yeah. Delicious, uh, but it's the same for us, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, same I mean, rules we can do it together, right? So, um, my I just recently discovered that my dog loves broccoli. So oh, there you go. Right. Exciting, yeah. I have no idea. So, yep. um, I've got a bell someone, pepper fan. <laughs> oh, you do. Okay, great, great. Um, and then maybe on that note, it, with someone had asked about the gas of, of feeding those type of foods. It, you know, should you be concerned about that or? Yeah, I think if you have a bulldog, probably. Um, I would say, you know, usually it's, it's things like the cruciferous, like the Brussels sprouts, the, the cauliflowers and broccolis that are the ones that are going to have the sulforaphanes and things in there that are going to ferment away in the, in the hind gut. A little more than green beans and then the, you know, carrots, et cetera. I mean, actually, when you eat a raw carrot, you get very little from it because it's, it's hard to digest that. So... Um, those are the kind of things you're probably not going to get. You'll get a little more stool volume, but you won't get a whole lot of gas. And I, every dog and cat's different. So right. um, I, I didn't experience the zucchini gas. So <laughs> kind of, that's I haven't had enough experience with the zucchini or, or the, the summer squash to know if that's going to cause any gas in my cat. Great, okay, good. Um, this is a good question about, um, you know, as cats age and they lose a lot of weight, the, the wasting. So is it better to go in with, with an overweight cat, um, especially, yeah. but then if they have, you know, can, can they help survive better with failing kidneys, you know, if they're overweight? Yeah. Once a cat's about fifth, uh, sorry, about 12, 13 years of age and they come in at a seven, I don't worry about them being a little bit okay. overweight because it's been pretty well documented that cats who are a little overweight tend to actually live longer with whatever disease they have because they will lose weight during that kidney failure. And, and we don't put a cat down because of the numbers. We put a cat down because the cat can't get up anymore and just looks so bad because lean, lean muscle wasting and the weight loss. And so, yeah, I don't get too worried when there are six, you know, it's seven and eight. I started talking about like, you know, we try to do a little portion control and not get them any heavier for sure if you're a seven. And you're an eight or a nine, we've got to have a talk about trying to get some weight off. Great. Great. I had that situation, you know, my cat was diagnosed with cancer. And so I was, he was losing weight. So I had my other cat. So I was feeding more, yeah. so, you know, to, so that he wouldn't lose too much and thinking, you know, eventually I would get to, you know, but, but fortunately he lived three years, which was mm -hmm. wonderful, except for she's now trying to deal with getting the other cat's weight other down cat. you know i didn't <laughs> right. uh, my vet right, right. she wasn't worried about it she's like okay we'll deal with it later but then it's three years later you know so it's, right, it's right. tricky but know, yeah it's time for the uh, time for the tough love it is it is um uh okay let's see so um let's see slow down your dog's eating um like the slow feeder balls. Bowl. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there are people who use the, the peg bowls to try and get them to eat slower. Um, you know, there's not a lot of evidence that eating fast is going to cause GDV. So, I mean, you know, raised bowls, bowls on the ground. Yeah, I, I agree that some of them just need to have their kibble packed in a Kong and let them work it out because, uh, and that may be actually a decent solution for the picky eater versus the, the dog who's who's uh, ravenous and, and maybe giving that kind of a peg feeder or a, a Kong feeder to the dog who's, rav uh, who's ravenous and let the pick eater uh, have a little more time at the bowl, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, you know, most dogs are gonna eat as fast as they can. That's just their nature, right? As a pack animal. And if you have GI issues or regurgitation, then yeah, you have to break it into smaller meals and you have to try and kind of watch how much they're getting. And then I think those peg feeder bowls are, are pretty pretty useful at slowing that whole process down. Okay, good. Um, one, uh, I have a question about that, a dog that was a breeding dog, um, she just adopted her and that the dog, she said her vet said that the dog has a pot belly. Um, but she says it was breeding dog. How do I know if it's weight or fat or from breeding? Yeah. Usually um, a female dog's not going to have a pot belly. I mean, I, I have a dog downstairs who we bred 
you know, a couple times and she doesn't have that kind of a pop belly. She has some loose skin. So if it's a true pop belly, I think there's a little bit more of the idea that she either has a lot of intra-abdominal fat, um, but I think you always have to think about Cushing's disease too, because that can be you know, something that leads to that kind of pot belly appearance. That's, that's so helpful, yeah. Something to work, work on with the vet for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a specific time in the evening to remove food or water? Does it matter, you know, people, what time? Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't really touch on this, but I was a big fan of the 11 o'clock at night feeding of cats. <laughs> because it's like you watch David Letterman, you feed the cat. Right. I mean, that was sort of what we did is, you know, you, you watch your Jimmy Fallon, you feed the cat because you know that the cat's still going to get you up at five o'clock in the morning. And if you feed the cat at eight o'clock at night, then the cat's going to. And we used to try to give more of the, the daily meal in the evening so that the cat would uh, be full at night because I wasn't at home during the day. So I don't care if he's meowing at everybody else. Right. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> and that's when I mean, I, I was actually kicked out of my bed at one point for because my cat was driving us crazy. And that's when I went to that approach. And I was like, we're doing zucchini and we're, I'm, we're sleeping until five. We're not getting up at three anymore. So, I've worked. Uh, that's good. I, yeah, speaking of David Letterman, I remember I'd heard you speak and you told the story of the, the couple, I think. Oh yeah. They were trying, yeah. Did you tell that? It was, <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, no, this is the people came all the way from Ontario because their dogs couldn't lose weight and they were going on. They wanted this new drug that I was briefly talking about. And, we did a little, a little, I like to call it house. We were playing house and questioning them and getting tough with them. And then and the, 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 the husband's sitting in the corner reading a book and, the, and the, the wife is just going, oh, no, no, we don't feed anything. Only eating like, you know, three quarters of a cup and they're cabbies and it's a low calorie food. And I was just like, it just doesn't make any sense. And then uh, she said, uh, she just looks at her husband and just goes, Bob, Bob, you don't feed them, right? Cause, and he goes, well, we all eat a a scoop of ice cream when I'm watching David Letterman every night. And you just should have seen the fire come out of her eyes because she was just like, we drove all the way from Ontario to New York to find out you're feeding ice cream to the dogs. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story. And I think that happens probably more often than, you know, yes. we think, right? Always watch husbands. Husbands are notorious. <laughs> that's good. Um, let's see. So uh, is there a particular canned food you recommend um, for weight loss? What do you think about, you know, we did touch on those weight loss diets and just, is that helpful or? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically tell folks to look for anything that's got, you know, if you don't wanna go, I'll be honest with you, I, I like to, to use things like Tiki Cat because they're really high in moisture and they're typically really high in protein. And so that's kind of my go-to for the diabetic or pre-diabetic and, and often it's pretty good for weight loss. Um, you know, they, they have these little three ounce cans, you give a three ounce can in the morning at night and they're like literally 60 some odd, 67 to 70 calories. And so, I mean, we've, I've worked with that a lot. And then of course I, I work with the therapeutics because they're, you know, 119 calories in a can. It's perfect. You split it right down the middle. They have half in the morning, half at night. They're all higher in protein than a lot of the other stuff that's typically out there. And the same thing with dogs is <clears throat> there, there are actually some pretty good foods out there. Um, and I'll have to say to myself or say to you that there's some over-the-counters that I feel comfortable with because I helped formulate them. Um, you know, Animate has something called Lean for Dogs. And then there's another company, uh, Authority, which is the PetSmart brand. They've got a nice high protein, um, advanced wellness weight reduction that, that I use as over-the-counters for, for weight loss programs for dogs. And then I hit the therapeutics when I realize that's not really working as well because they need to be so calorie restricted. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, this is a whole other topic than, uh, you know, grain-free versus grain. And, and, and this, I know from your, obviously, your nutrition experience as well. What yeah, um, I, I think that there's uh, unfortunately too many people reading the FDA's stuff, which is highly unconclusive, um, has nothing to do with taurine. Um, there are some people that are working on it now and doing some experimental studies, and they're suggesting it's about ingredient choice, not so much grain-free but what you're putting together with that grain-free. Um, there's a lot of low quality meat meals out there being used in some of these exotic foods, kangaroo, you know, alligator. They're not using the stuff that you're eating at the restaurant. They're basically stripping the meat from the bone and using that. So that's part of, I think, the problem. And I think that uh, there'll be a, probably a lot more coming out on that in, in the next few months. 
Yeah, that's I because I constantly am seeing kangaroo, ostrich. So that's an yeah. interesting perspective because I think you think, oh, it's so exotic and oh, you know, but yeah, yeah right. No. And they're great for novel protein diets, but they have mm -hmm. to actually use the meat. <laughs> they can't just use all the, <laughs> exactly. all exactly. the you know, sinew and bone and things like that. So. Let's see. Um, uh, different. Oh, you know what? This is what I want to ask too about cats and dogs. Why cats and dogs, or can they you know, sharing food? Why is it bad? And yeah, it's funny. It's actually probably worse for a cat because cats have slightly different nutrient requirements, and they're usually higher than a dog. But in general, if a dog likes cat food, God bless, go for it. And if your cat's stealing a few pieces of kibble from the dog, it's not that big of a deal. But, um, you know, it really comes down to the taurine concentration. And because of the grain free crisis that uh, has reared its head or whatever you would like to call it, almost all the companies are adding taurine into their dog foods at cat amounts. So short of some thiamine and a couple of other B vitamins, it's not that different, to be honest with you. Great. It's just um, so. Okay, good, good. Um, and then just the last question, just if you could address a little bit about, I know there have been many recalls in the news recently. Yeah. So just sort of how to deal with that. Um, and should you maybe feed your pets more than one type of food to, so that if the food is recalled, how, and how do you deal with that without getting the GI upset um, in switching foods? Yeah. Why are there um, so many, <laughs> you know? The, right, the well, I mean, I think, yeah, the, the bottom line is most healthy dogs can do a switch in two or three days. It's not a, you know, it's a long, it's not really a long drawn out process unless you have GI disease. So I usually tell people three days, right? One quarter, 75% from the old food, then half and half the next day. And then you know, usually you're in pretty good shape. Most dogs don't have an issue with that kind of thing. Um, you know, if we're, I can't remember what, what was the other part of that question? Was it, I, I uh, think just hearing about the, like the aflatoxins, they just yeah. be- Yeah, yeah. So the, the mycotoxin, aflatoxin stuff that was in that sport mix that recently came out. So that, that, that made the headlines. and. And uh, yeah, that should be recalled. And that's, that's, that's just poor manufacturing. They should all be testing their product before it even hits. I mean, and they usually do um, good manufacturing. You will test those products before they actually make it into your food chain and into the, into kibble. And the fact that they did not test multiple areas in the truckload, usually it's corn, sometimes it's wheat, but that's just bad manufacturing. Now salmonella, that's a whole different ball game. And that's usually the thing that's, that's hits you know, the screen more often is the recalls due to, to salmonella. And uh, the reality is, is you're never going to get away from that if you're using poultry. It's just very hard to, to get away from it. Now, hopefully, um, in an extruded product, you killed most of it. And that's in all reality, we know that raw foods and some of those types of things always have more salmonella contamination. Now, whether it's going to get your dog or cat sick, um, you know, there have been definitely cases of dogs getting it from dry food and definitely cases of dogs getting it from uh, home prepared diets or, or you know, some of these raw diets that are commercially available. Um, the reality is, is probably, strangely enough, if you're really worried about salmonella, stay away from poultry. Yeah, okay. well, that makes sense. Um, I know with the pandemic, we had there was a shortage of some brands of, of the food because I think that's the fact, you know, the processing plants were yeah. shut down. So yeah, I know mm -hmm. it's just affected, affected everything. Um, so, all right, well, this was really, really wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Watchlog, and thank you to everyone again for joining sure, us. Thanks. This was super informative and everyone take care and we will see you next time.